Hello, this is Peter Denning, speaking to you today about computational thinking. Let me begin with introducing myself. Who am I? Well, I'm a computer scientist. I've, I've been a computer scientist since 1964, and I've seen a lot of computer science come and go. I've done work in virtual memory operating systems, performance evaluation, internet, computational science, and innovation leadership. I've taught computer science at MIT, Princeton, Purdue, George Mason, and Naval Postgraduate School. I founded a research institute called REACTS at NASA Ames Research Center, specializing in computational science. I've published 13 books. The three most recent ones, images are shown here. The Innovator's Way is about leadership practices for producing adoption of innovations. The Great Principles of Computing is about just what it says. What are the fundamental timeless principles of computing? And computational thinking is about a specific practice of computing called computational thinking, and that's the topic of the rest of this discussion today. Well, this is at a conference for John von Neumann. He's one of my heroes in history of computer science, foundations of computer science. He was a polymath. He was a virtuoso at calculation. He saw advanced calculating machines as essential for progress of science and technology. He is responsible for the von Neumann computing architecture, which is uh, pervasive in all computers today. He saw many parallels between brains and computers. This, this topic fascinated him. Could computers be brains was one of his questions. I don't know whether he ever got to an answer for that one, but I do know that he was an inveterate computational thinker. Well, what is computational thinking? Well, I use the abbreviation CT for computational thinking. One of the common meanings of it is a K-12 education movement started around 19, uh, sorry, 2006. The other meaning of computational thinking is just the disciplines of thinking to design computations well. <clears throat> well, let's talk about the definition of computational thinking. This is, this is something that's evolved over the years. In the 1960s, when the first computer science departments were being founded, computational thinking was called logical and procedural thinking for computer methods. In the 1980s, 20 years later, it was advanced quite a bit. It was seen as a third way of doing science. Up to that point, science was seen as advancing through theory and experiment. Beginning in the 1980s, science was also advancing through computation. In 2006, we'll come back to this in a moment, there was a milestone where Jeanette Wing published an editorial on computational thinking, and there she defined it as thinking like a computer scientist. A few years later, around 2010, there was a kind of consensus that said computational thinking was formulating problems so that their solutions can be expressed as computational steps and algorithms that can be performed by information agents. And then at the modern time uh, now, uh, computational thinking has two distinct meanings. One is designing methods that get computers to do jobs for us. And second is explaining and interpreting the world as a complex of information processes.
We should note that computational thinking is not the same as computer science. Computer science, CS, is the field of study of information processes, both natural and artificial. Let's look at the history of computational thinking. It actually goes way back before the beginning of computer science. In the ancients, millennia ago, math the ancients talked about math-based algorithms and methods. For example, Euclid's algorithm comes from that time. Much more recently, around 1820, Charles Babbage proposed a dif difference engine to compute tables like navigation tables for the Navy to avoid human errors. Human errors in the table were common, and the difference engine was going to be able to create those tables without any errors. Uh, Babbage was having trouble implementing it uh, and conceived of a more efficient design, which he called the analytic engine, and it was uh, actually designed for general computation. This was around 1840. He formed a partnership with Ada Lovelace, and they uh, looked at all sorts of issues around the analytic engine, including how to program it. She came up with one of the first computer programs, uh, and she also speculated that this machine was much more general than doing computation, arithmetic computations, and she called it the science of operations, the ability to manipulate any kind of a symbol with this machine. More, much more recently, the United States Air Force published a description of ways of thinking of, for information technology professionals. What would they need to be successful? The beginning, near the beginning of computer science itself, the pioneers, uh, Alan per Perlis and Forsyth, talked in terms like algorithmizing, meaning creating algorithms and procedural methods as characterizing uh, computer science. Papert was the first to actually use the term computational thinking in 1980 in one of his books. He kind of did it in passing and didn't actually propose it as a definition at that point. Then in, in the 1980s, computational science grew up in the other sciences outside of computer science, and it was, computational thinking was seen there as a new way of doing science. Computational thinking in education has also evolved. <clears throat> this is within the computer age now. The first, first attempts at this were called computer literacy in the 1980s. There were a lot of courses proposed to teach young, young people how to be literate users of computers. They were not, not terribly popular. Then this turned into what was called computer fluency. It's like a, learning a language and becoming fluent in it. So you can not only do the uh, exercise, but you can design in it and explain in it. And that came in the 1990s. Then in 2006 came the Jeanette Wing editorial, which brought computational thinking to the foreground as a way of teaching computing to young people. And shortly after that, the National Science Foundation became an, adopted this idea and was an advocate of it and put substantial resources to promote it in the following years. Well, let's talk first about what is, when we're talking about teaching computer science, or computational thinking, CT, curriculum, what are we talking about? What, what are people teaching here? Well, one, generally speaking, we're talking about skillful practices of thought and design. We're not talking about concepts and methods. We're talking about practices. This means you can be you, as you practice them more and more, you get more experience, you can get better and better at them. There's a spectrum of things you can, practices you can learn, which goes 
from computational thinking for beginners at the left end to computational thinking for professionals at the right end. Computational thinking for beginners has a whole list of things that people want to teach kids there uh, in various ways. There's a lot of discussion about in the education community about how to do that. But the topics they want to cover are abstraction, data collection, data analysis, data representation, algorithms and procedures, problem decomposition, automation, parallelization, and simulation. That's a pretty crowded curriculum, so the, the curriculum for the younger people kind of ends there with this list of, of topics. When you get into higher education, the, you start learning all sorts of additional topics which are much more advanced than what the beginners learn. I call these CT, computational thinking for professionals. As to be a practicing professional, you better be good at many of these things. So these include neural networks, artificial intelligence, computational complexity, software engineering, operating systems, networks, graphics and images, distributed computing, and performance modeling. I think you can see there's a pretty big difference between basic computational thinking and this advanced kind that professionals need. So the computational thinking for beginners is associated with the K-12 uh, education system and computational thinking for professionals is associated with universities, graduate school, and also with professional experience. Well, computational thinking also comes with various misconceptions about it. It's, uh, for many people, it's a new idea. They hadn't thought about this before 2006. They're relative newcomers to computing. They didn't know there was a long history behind it before it came out uh, and started an educational movement. And so the people who have been uh, describing computational thinking and proposing what we need to study have included various misconceptions about computing in their curricula. And I put these in two categories, annoyances and big deals. Annoyances are misconceptions that are you know, minor annoyances. They're not, they don't cause serious trouble, and they're probably pretty easily cleared up by talking to people about them. The big deals are more serious misconceptions that actually mislead people. They're trying to design software or design new hardware, the, they can get things wrong. And the programs that create have errors in them, don't perform as expected and can create harm. So let me go into some of the examples of this. Among the annoyances uh, is, is a belief that computational thinking is a new approach to problem solving. Well, I, I hope you can see from the very brief summary at the beginning that there's a long history going back a thousand years of uh, people using computation uh, as an approach to problem solving. So this, this is not a new approach. It's an old approach to problem solving. We've obviously enhanced it in the modern age because we have the new tool, the computer. But it's the idea of Thinking computationally is not a new idea. The second annoyance is a belief that everything you need to know about computational thinking is in that basic computational thinking foundation, which I was calling CT for beginners. Abstraction, recursion, etc. Those, those basic things, which are actually basics of programming. So it's not true that to be a computational thinker, you, that's all you need to know, especially if you wind up growing up and going into a profession, you're going to need to go way beyond that and learn what we I was calling computational thinking for professionals. Another 
uh, annoying misconception is the claim that computational thinking is for everybody. Well, I can think of many, I'm sure you can too, think of many people who don't particularly uh, want to use computers or, or computation in their work, so they don't think about it. So they don't need to know this. They would, uh, if you tried to teach it to them, they'd probably say they're not interested. So this, this is not necessarily for everybody. A fourth misconception is a claim that it's nothing more than logical thinking. Logical thinking simply means the ability to decompose a problem solution into steps and then specify the problem solution as a series of steps that follow logically from one to the next. And so being able to do that is called logical thinking. However, computational thinking also includes much more uh, important, larger tasks than simply putting together uh, instructions in a sequence. Uh, it, it has to do with design. How do you design a software system that has requirements and you can demonstrate to the users that it meets the requirements? How do you organize a software development project with hundreds or thousands of programmers so that it successfully deals a very large application uh, that that works. So there's more to computational thinking than logical thinking. The another annoying claim is is this one: think, computational thinking means to think like a computer scientist. Well, you can certainly say a computer scientist is a specialist at computational thinking, but. Uh, it's also, you know, if I were a physicist or a chemist or an economist or somebody in another field, I might say I, I don't particularly want to learn how to think like a computer scientist. I have, have enough trouble learning how to be a good thinker in my field. So not everybody wants to think like a computer scientist, yet computational thinking is valuable to them in some forms of their problem solving. So those are the uh, annoying claims. Let me now take a look at the bigger ones that can actually cause harm if people actually act on them. One of them is an ancient problem with computer science is the, the perception that computer science equals programming. So in other words, if you can learn how to program well in a programming language, uh, you have learned computer science. Well. Programming is one of many areas of computer science. There's many other areas like algorithms and data structures and getting even farther from programming is, is graphics and operating systems and databases and uh, networks, software engineering, There's many things that are, go way beyond programming and they, in, into design of computers, into design of computations. So this is a dangerous perception and unfortunately has plagued the field of computer science for many years. And uh, we thought we had defeated it some years ago, but uh, this misperception is coming back uh, with computational thinking uh, advocates un unwittingly promoting this idea. Another big deal thing is that computational thinking is about algorithms and machines play a minor role. So in other words, the idea is that an algorithm can run on any machine, so uh, machines don't matter anywhere near as much as algorithms. However, when you think about it, this, this claim doesn't make any sense because you can't run an algorithm without a machine. The way we have been taught to think about algorithms, since at least since uh, I went through a programming curriculum, was an algorithm is a step-by-step -step procedure. Well, that idea of step-by-step -step procedure has been around for a long time, and it's built into the so-called von Neumann architecture, the big contribution of John von Neumann. The, the idea that there's a program counter in the machine, and it clicks off one instruction after the next is part of the machine. And this has colored the way we think about algorithms. 
We have new kinds of machines arriving today. They're uh, neural networks. Uh, among them, the biggies, big type of machine, which doesn't. A different type of machine requires a different kind of thinking altogether. It doesn't involve step-by-step -step thinking anymore. So CT is not about algorithms. Machines has to be part of it. The architecture of machines has to be part of it. As I just mentioned, the definitions that we about algorithms and programs we have in our programming books implicitly assume a von Neumann architecture. It implicitly assumes there's some computational agent going through it one step at a time, following the logical sequence given in the program. Well, th this has been a very powerful notion, has survived for many, many years, since the middle 1940s. And now, today, we have new kinds of architectures appearing on the scene, which are not von Neumann architectures, but which are very important, and we can't think about them in this step-by-step -step manner any further. We, we need to think bigger. Another misleading uh, claim is that human and machine information agents are equivalent. And this is based on the idea that once we have an algorithm written down, a machine can follow the steps, but, but so also can a human. And what's the difference? Is Well, the machine's going to be faster and the human's going to be slower, but in the end, they both carry out the computation. Well, this, this is also a very misleading conception because uh, it's just not true. Uh, they are not equivalent. Humans can do small algorithms and small programs. Machines can do fast algorithms that are very fast and very large compared to anything that a human can do. Uh, I like to think that a, you know, a, a fast-thinking human can do about one calculation per second, and a fast machine can do a trillion calculations per second. This means machines can do things that are impossible for humans to do. And in fact, that's one of the reasons we have machines, is to do tasks for us that we can't do ourselves simply because we don't have the capability or the time or the resource. So the machines are useful because they are different from us, not because they are equivalent. Uh, sometimes I've heard this claim here, computational thinking is a replacement for computer science. Well, again, this is a misconception about computer science. Computer science is so much bigger and so much broader than programming and algorithms, which is the basic idea of, of uh, computer, computational thinking for beginners. So... Computer, computational thinking is not a replacement for computer science. At best, you could say it's a component of computer science. Another misconception is computational thinking transfers to all domains. So what this means is that if you learn how to program, say, or learn how to solve problems computationally in computer science, in a computer science course, you'll be able to take that skill to any other domain. So you could take it to physics or chemistry or aerodynamics, mechanical engineering, economists, you know, whatever. Well, this turns out not to be true. There's research that actually studied that and they've disproved this. It does not transfer. You need to have domain knowledge. So the computer scientist that, who wants to collaborate, say, with a uh, aeronautics engineer needs to know some aeronautic engineering and some aeronautic science in order to be an effective collaborator. So it, it just simply having the programming knowledge is not good enough to be able to go work with people in other domains. You have to learn something about their domain in order to be able to, to collaborate successfully with them. So computational thinking can assist in other domains, but it doesn't just transfer over. Another
claim is computational thinking applies to all problem solving. So uh, give me any problem and I can find a way to deal with that problem computationally. Well, that's not really true. That's an overclaim. There's lots of things around that we call problems that have nothing to do with machines and computation, like social problems, for example. And uh, so computational thinking does not help us with that type of problem. Another claim is computational thinking is timeless. It's getting, it's, it's bringing out timeless basic principles and it's not affected by emerging technologies. Well, that is also nonsense because uh, we have several new emerging technologies today, such as artificial intelligence technologies, the machine learning, uh, the neural network, and, and we also have the emerging quantum computing. Uh, these are new kinds of technologies. They are, they are uh, programmed in a different way from von Neumann architectures, and we need to think differently about how to program them and design them. So we are affected by emerging technologies, and in order to, be, to carry, carry forward, we need to constantly adapt computational thinking to the design problems and the technologies that are presented to us. Well, those are the main uh, misconceptions. So uh, for the future, I'm looking forward to, uh, as we gain more understanding and more consensus on computational thinking, we are going to see that computation, we will recognize that computation thinking is domain dependent, that it is different for beginners than for professionals, that it is a mental design practice rather than simply a set of concepts, and finally, it's different for different kinds of computers. You already mentioned neural networks, generative AI models, and quantum computers. We have each of those is a different way of thinking about computation, and uh, if we're going to use computational thinking with them, we have to train ourselves, to train our minds in a different way. So, anyway, that brings me to the end of this discussion about computational thinking. If you are uh, interested in, in this, uh, you saw the book that I had wrote with a colleague, Mehdi Tidra, uh, on the second slide, and you can go get that book and read more about it there. But uh, it, this is, uh, in many ways, a continuation of the way John von Neumann wanted to think about things and, and uh, use this kind of thinking for problem solving and design. And of course, uh, in the, the book that he put together on co computers in the brain, he was particularly interested in the questions of whether the brain could be a computer and, and uh, or the brain could, or a computer could be a brain, either way. And uh, I don't know whether he's answered that to his satisfaction, but those questions are still with us today. And they still drive uh, a lot of, of science and technology. Anyway, so I'm very pleased to have been able to talk to you for a few minutes on this topic. And I thank you for listening.